So we're in Mark chapter 8. We're going to be looking at verse 27. And you remember that Mark's consistent theme uh, is basically who is Jesus? Who is the Christ? Who is, in this context, also the Son of Man? And we're approaching the middle of Mark's gospel, and nearly everyone uh, Jesus knew had struggled with who he was, even his closest followers had difficulties. And so the readers of, of Mark's gospel, the original readers, had an advantage over the people who first met Jesus. Because in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, do you remember what Mark said about Jesus? In that verse, he says that it's the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so his disciples, of course, were Christians, so they would have known that. Uh, and as those who first received this gospel, they're going to get evidence to support them in the persecution that's coming up in their lives in the near future. His 12 disciples were among those who had difficulty. They saw all that was going on, all the events he was involved in. They witnessed his miracles and his behavior. But it was only in the last journeys with Jesus that they were beginning to see the truth. And as we talked about last week, like the blind man, their spiritual eyesight came to them slowly. They needed the help of God if they were going to be the leaders in, in the church that Christ would build. So when we start in Mark chapter 8, verse 27, an unknown period of time has passed since Jesus had restored the sight of the blind man in Bethsaida. And we learn in verse 27 that Jesus took his disciples north of the Sea of Galilee to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. So, on your map, north of the Sea of Galilee, all the way here in the foothills of uh, Mount Hermon, is a city called Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea comes from what? Caesar. There was a place of worship there to Caesar. It, it was built at a time when it was a center of multiple religions. For example, the heathen god Pan had a temple there, and there was a cave in some area that was designated to him. Augustus Caesar took it, though, and gave it to Herod, and Herod the Great built a temple there in honor of the emperor, and that's how it got its name, Caesarea. But in order to distinguish it from the Caesarea that you see over here on the coast, and this one is up here, he called it Caesarea Philippi, because Herod's son Philip the Tetrarch uh, received it later and enlarged the town, and that's how it got its name. Afterwards, it was called Neronius. Does anybody know why it would be called Neronius? Nero, isn't that interesting? If we changed the cities in America every time we got a new president, although they're not, you know, dictators or anything like that, uh, we have a, a little bit of a funny situation where the, the name of the city changes and changes over time, depending on who is, is ruling. But that's a little bit about the background of where we are in Mark's gospel. Some time has passed, and he's going to take his disciples farther north up to the headwaters of the Jordan River. When I was teaching English in a public school in Slovakia, at the end of the term, the students had two exams. They had a, an oral exam and a written exam. So even in English, they had an exam, but the oral exam was not questions about uh, grammar or rules of, of writing. The oral questions were about one of 13 topics that the Ministry of Education determined the students needed to be able to discuss fluently in English. Now, why would they want them to discuss fluently in English? They speak Slovak in Slovakia global language and so not all of the nations in europe although they are now a union understand each other's languages but most of them have a significant number of people who speak english and so the ministry of education uh, took 13 topics 
and we would get them in English. These are the topics you're going to discuss this year, and we would write lessons for them. But at the end of the year, they would write them on a card, one of the topics, they'd turn it over and they'd be laying on the table. You'd go up there and pick up the card, turn it over, and there was your topic in your question. You had some time to prepare, and then you had a certain amount of time that you talked, and they, they evaluated your response. For example, one was, what is the greatest threat to the world's natural environment, and how can this threat be avoided or resolved? That is a, a, a common uh, topic of discussion among governments in Europe, and of course, these students that I had needed to be able to respond to that. I took the 13 topics. I was only going to be able to teach on eight, and I let them choose. Guess what? They didn't choose that one. I told them, <laughs> I told them, you will have to be prepared for all 13. All I'm doing is giving you an opportunity to create a vocabulary and to practice. And so the year before we had that topic, and I gave them in their written exam to write a short paragraph about how they were helping the problem of the environment and waste products. And virtually all of them said, well, I'm not really doing anything right now because uh, I'm living at home. <laughs> and they recycled glass because, you know, their parents did that. They used glass back in those days more than they did plastic. And so I thought it was kind of funny here. They could answer everything the government wanted them to know. They just weren't doing it. Uh, <laughs> and so maybe that's our, our nature. We know more than we do, correct? Mm, even in the scripture, <laughs> even in the scripture. And so they used these questions to spark their thinking. They used uh, English because it was international language. And it gave them an opportunity to be prepared for what they would find as adults that they would be voting for and deciding about concerning some of these topics. And so when we come to Mark chapter 8, verse 27, Jesus begins teaching his disciples and he uses a question. And the question leads to other things, but it's not surprising that uh, a question can be used to prepare people for a particular topic. And so in verse 27, it says, Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he questioned his disciples, saying to them, who do people say that I am? And they told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others, one of the prophets. And he continued by questioning them. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. And he warned them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Okay, so Jesus uses questions in his preparation of the 12. What is it that he basically is asking in verse 27? What is he trying to get them to discuss, consider? Yeah, the same question that Mark's been dealing with all along. Who is he really? Who is he really? Why was this a good time for Jesus to ask his disciples this question? Yes. It's getting near the end of his ministry, and he needs to be sure he's communicated to them. In the middle of, the, uh, of his ministry at this point, in the middle of Mark's record of it, where's his next big destination? The cross. He's going to be going to Judah and Jerusalem. What are they going to find when they get there? Yes, not as friendly as it has been as they travel in Galilee, even among the Gentiles. And so he needs to get down to, have you, have you learned what has been 
revealed about me because it's going to get a, a difficult environment when they get back to Jerusalem. He's been revealing through his proclamation of the kingdom of God, through his teaching, which they recognized was superior to the scribes, through his miraculous powers, the way that he could handle demons and disease and even death and even the weather. But he had not fully revealed the details of who he was as the Christ. And he had forbidden the only ones who truly knew to speak about him. Who truly knew who he was that he forbid to speak? The demons. <laughs> he forbid them to speak. They knew who he was. They understood that they had a destiny with him. They were the ones who also were forbidden to speak. However, the 12 would soon need to have a response for those that they would meet in the region of Judea when, when people ask, who is Jesus? What is his purpose? What are you doing in supporting him? And so they will be faced with the true identity of who Jesus is. They needed to deal with these realities in advance. They needed to have some time to understand what it was going to mean when they fully understand, understood who he was and what was going to happen. So uh, the questions are, are at an appropriate time. Peter's and the disciples' confession that Jesus was the Christ was a very important turning point. What are some of the identities that they suggest for Jesus in verse 28? Elijah, for example. Why Elijah, do you suppose? He was a prophet, well-known, powerful, exhibited signs. In Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, the prophet commented about the widespread expectation that Elijah would return in the last days. Mark chapter 9, verse 11, we'll get there in, in a few uh, days, um, also points out this. Jesus' powers that he evidenced might have brought to mind the people who thought of Elijah. Elijah's own words reveal that he was a forerunner of the Messiah. So he wasn't actually the Messiah, but sometimes people kind of bend the, the prophet's uh, words a little bit to fit with what they wanted to believe. Jesus considered that this promise about the Elijah being the forerunner was fulfilled in whom? John the Baptist. So when you go back and look, yes, there are things that might cause them to believe that. But in fact, if you look closely at what was written, you'll see um, that the text does not support that idea. So one of them was Elijah. The other one we've mentioned was John the Baptist, okay? Who believed that John the Baptist was walking around doing these miracles? Especially who believed? Who had a guilty conscience? Herod. Herod. First thing Herod thought was, oh, John the Baptist has been resurrected. That was guilty conscience because John said he was pointing to someone who would come after him. Something about his sandals? He's not worthy even to deal uh, with a, a person's uh, feet and their sandals. So John made it really clear, no, I, I'm, I'm not this person that's going to be wandering around. Um, and so there were uh, some who would say a prophet could have been Jeremiah or some other famous prophet. There are passages that in Deuteronomy 18, for example, verse 17 through 20, predict that God would raise up a prophet to lead the people. So what does the word prophet mean? Someone who speaks for God. That it's it's, it's simple, it's basic. We sometimes give it more meaning than it intends. So anyone who spoke for God could be considered a prophet. Some just did it by the power of God, and they could speak of the future. But some of them, like Moses, didn't, didn't just speak of the future. What did Moses speak of? Present. How did he speak of the past? He wrote about Genesis. He wasn't there. So the prophet received the information of the past as well as the future, or as you said, the present. So uh, these are some of the possibilities that people thought Jesus might be. Which obvious person is not in their list? Jeremiah is not there. Isaiah is not there. One that's more obvious than that. 
They didn't name the Messiah. They didn't call him the Messiah. These people are well known and prophets predicted them, but the Messiah was well known too. It's not that there's no record that people considered this possibility. Probably we've forgotten. In, in, in John chapter 1, 40 through 41, uh, Andrew told Simon about Jesus and suggested perhaps this is the Messiah. So even among the disciples, it had been discussed early on in John's gospel. Also in John chapter 4, verse 25, the woman at the well uh, got in a discussion with Jesus about the Messiah. And what did he tell her? I am he. I am the Messiah. So the idea was known. What was the reason it probably wasn't very popular? Didn't fit in with their idea of who the Messiah was. That's the challenge. So in verse 29, Jesus changes his question. Not what do people uh, say I am or who I am. He changes it to what? Who do you? This you is emphasized. If Tommy was here, he would tell you a little bit about the Greek. If you're reading it in Greek, it stands out. Who do you say that I am? And what was the answer? You are the Christ. And in, in Matthew's gospel, do you remember what he said in addition? The son of the living God, exactly. So you are the Christ, the son of the living God. What did it mean to say that Jesus was the Christ? What did that mean? This requires a little bit of history, but part of it is involved in the word. What does the word Christ mean? This is a Greek version of the Hebrew. The Hebrew is Messiah. So Christ and Messiah mean the same thing. Just about everywhere I traveled in Europe, they had those two words in their language, just like we do. Okay, um, because they incorporated it. And yet we don't always know what it means. Christ means anointed. Messiah means anointed. If you go back in their history, when priests were chosen and when kings were chosen, what did they do? They poured oil on them. That was called an anointing. That anointing represented what? You were chosen. You were chosen by God. And so that's the idea of Messiah, the one who's chosen for a purpose, the one who set apart for a purpose. And so when they said that he was the Christ, that's what would come in their mind. He was the chosen one, the anointed one, the one uh, who was anointed with, with oil and have a, spe a specific task. Then in verse 30, why would Jesus warn the disciples not to tell anyone that, that he is Jesus the Christ? Why should they not tell people that he's the anointed one? Yes? It was already a trope. Yes. There would be some trouble. Anyway, even in Galilee, there was a struggle over who, is what, who he was and what his identity was. Uh, and one of the, the problems would be if they announced that he was the Messiah, what would people understand in someone saying that Jesus was the Messiah? What had their culture taught for centuries? Paul? He was going to take care of their enemies, get rid of the Romans, okay? What else was he going to do? He's going to conquer the world. They're going to be the richest nation in the world. They had this idea, and it was taught by their, their leaders, uh, that the Messiah had this particular role. And so if they went there and started teaching that, that would create a certain kind of interest that might not be helpful to the cause. But there was also another problem. Jesus, yeah, he, he did have work to do. And he had things to do before the, the time of uh, his appointment uh, on the cross. But part of the problem was what they thought would be the responsibility of the Messiah in opposition to what Jesus was going to say would happen to him. 
Remember, as they're traveling uh, three or four times uh, in Mark's gospel, he tells his disciples, I will go to Jerusalem. What's next? I will be arrested. I will be beaten. I will be turned over to the Gentiles. And I will be crucified. And on the third day, I will rise. Now, how many faithful Jews in Judea are going to accept that idea? None of them. That does not fit at all their understanding of who the Messiah is. So this is going to uh, create some problem. And, and the reality is, that's what his disciples believe. They are not the ones to be explaining to people who the Messiah is, because it's what they believe. The misunderstanding has been taught for centuries. They learned it well. They were under persecution from Rome. They were looking for relief. So Jesus doesn't want them going out and spreading ignorance. As much as he might explain it to them, they're filtering it through what they currently believe. Have you ever had that problem? You filtered what you were taught through what you currently believe, and then you had a aha moment. <laughs> <laughs> about many things, perhaps. It's in our nature. Uh, we want a, a kind of consistency, uh, maybe in our mind or something, and we tend to ignore the things that are not consistent. For example, we typically, and he will too, uh, turn to Isaiah 53. The prophet Isaiah indicated that the Messiah would suffer and die. How does that fit in? with their understanding of who the Messiah would be. It wouldn't fit in. This would be a difficult thing for them to teach. It's possible to understand what will happen to Jesus as the Messiah if you know the whole explanation of the Messiah. Jesus' end is not on the cross. Where is his end? Well, yeah, it, it, he doesn't actually have an end, but he's resurrected by God, and he set over all power and authority. So if you get the whole story, then, of course, you have some way to explain these uh, discouraging, uh, disparaging ideas about him being arrested and crucified, but you have to understand the cross. Yes, so his family had that problem. We found out they came to, to get a hold of him. They thought he was out of his mind. He's not sleeping. He's not eating. He's doing all these weird things. And they came down to Capernaum to get him. Yeah, that's right. Bill? You say at this time, he's, he's drawing, connecting the dots. Yes. Mm -hmm. Coming on the hills of him and feeding you know, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And he's telling them what's going to happen. It's almost like you're trying to slap upside down. Yes. And it says here, plainly, plainly. You're, you're, he's getting to the point where he has to confront them. And so this is his teaching method. He's asking them questions that they need to know in order to deal with what's ahead of them. And they don't know. We find here that if they could understand the cross, they could understand Isaiah. What is, the, what is the real message of the cross? Salvation. They thought of the cross as humiliation. It was the worst way to die. They did the worst things to you, to humiliate you and make you uh, appear uh, despicable. And so they misunderstood. It was necessary that he die on the cross for what reason? Without his blood, without his sacrifice, no sins were forgiven. They thought the sin problem was all wrapped up in what? Yeah, sacrifices. And plus, as you will notice, people would say, we have the temple. Okay, so they, they had a misunderstanding uh, of many of the key or foundational teachings. And so we find in Mark, that's what they call the messianic secret that he's always telling people don't tell. And it's not really specifically defined, but it seems 
clear that he didn't want to propagate the misunderstanding either of his enemies or of his, of his disciples. And he didn't really need the demons to be his representatives in community. <laughs> they didn't have a good reputation. So Jesus begins to teach so the disciples will understand exactly who he is. And he mentions in verse 31, the son of man. Who is this son of man? Yeah, this is from Daniel. You got to go back to, to Daniel chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14. The son of man there, if you, if you look at it, you begin to see something of who he is in his person and who he's connected to. So in verse 13, Daniel chapter 7, it says, I kept looking in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. So he's having night visions and he's looking to the clouds of heaven and one like the son of man is coming. He came up to the ancient of days. Who's the ancient of days? That's God. He came up to God and presented himself before him. So this one called the son of man in the clouds of heaven presents himself to the ancient of days. And in verse 14, it says, and to him was given dominion. So if, if Jesus as the Son of Man is doing the receiving, who's doing the giving? God the Father is doing the giving. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So uh, the, the fulfillment is found in what Jesus himself said concerning his kingdom. Because remember Pilate, Pilate had heard, so people are saying you are king, are you, are, are you a king? And Jesus basically told him what? Yes, basically he says yes, but there's a, a clarification, my kingdom, is not of this world. So he had a spiritual kingdom. So if you're understanding who he is as the Messiah and as the son of man, you begin to see this is a spiritual uh, kingdom. This is a spiritual king. This is authority and dominion that he has that's beyond uh, the earthly world. And so what happens to him in Isaiah 53 is very troubling and very sad, but it's not the end of the story. The end of the story is that he was resurrected and he uh, is reigning as king. So um, they're getting it a little bit at a, at a time, but they needed to know that some of the things they currently believe are not true. Those things have to be vacated. This description of the Son of Man, uh, you might say just from the word man, points, points to what about him? He's human. I mean, he's also God. We find that to be the case. But he's called the Son of Man. It points to the fact that he is human. And while praying in the garden before his arrest, he said to the disciples that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So he had to deal with the fact that he was a man, that he was a human. And so we're, we're looking at another confirmation that he is the Messiah. He's the one in the visions, the one the Ancient of Days has given dominion over all the earth. But in verse 31, Jesus comes back to what Isaiah and the other prophets have pointed to. What does he predict in verse 31? And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. And the disciples said, we finally get it. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> what did Peter say? He rebuked him. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. This is the very word that Jesus used to cast out demons when he rebuked them. That's what they're saying to Jesus, who they believe is the Messiah. He rebuked him, but turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. So 
Jesus is talking with Peter. Peter took him aside, you remember. And when Jesus predicts his death and suffering as found in Isaiah and in the other uh, works of prophecy, Peter rebukes him. But Jesus doesn't answer Peter until he turns around and sees the disciples. What's going on there? Why his, did his turning around and seeing the disciples provoke this correction? Exactly. Peter is probably not the only one thinking that. He's just the only one with what? <laughs> or courage, we might say. He's the only one that could say it out loud. The uh, apostles, but Jesus knew. Turned and he saw, and they were probably all going, you know, he could hear their brains rattling up there because they were in such agreement with Peter. How could Jesus say such a thing? And when he's confirmed, basically, that they're probably all in the same camp, he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Well, this would have to be some rebuke to hear, you know, as a disciple. What's he basically saying to Peter? If you're not with me, you're against me. And who's the key against me person? Satan is. The devil. And so he says, get behind me, Satan. I had a book that said that. Maybe some of you had uh, have that book too. It says, get behind me, Satan. And uh, someone said to me, so why do you have a book where Jesus is asking Satan to get behind him? You know, like to promote him, to support him. <laughs> and I said, well, a, a key understanding of this title is you know the Bible text. When he said, get behind me, what did he mean? Get away. Because Peter was doing what? Why, get, why is he like Satan? Trying to get in the path of what Jesus was doing. Yes, he's trying to get in the path of what Jesus must do. Satan used whatever method he could to deter Jesus from the path that he was on. All the way up until the time he was arrested, he's struggling there. He asked his disciples to help him because the flesh is weak. Satan's purpose was to prevent Jesus from getting to the cross. Why? He knew what it meant, as did the demons. There is no salvation apart from the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And if Satan persuaded Jesus to give up on that purpose, he's not only persuaded Jesus, he's done what? Ruined it for the rest of us because there's no hope. Now, the Jews aren't thinking that way. They're thinking the hope is in what? Yeah, who they are, their heritage, their rulers, and their priesthood, and their animal sacrifices. But that, in fact, was not the reason. The Jews under the Old Covenant, the same as the people in the patriarchal age, were saved by what? It's mentioned in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. We are saved by grace through faith. That's the only way anyone has ever been saved. In order to pay for your own sins, it would require what? Death, spiritual and physical. You would lose your soul to pay for your sin. What would be the point? You've not gained anything by that. You can have that without doing anything. And so the, the idea that the disciples need to have confirmed in their mind, which is not clear yet, is what Jesus is telling them is the solution to the biggest problem they have. The biggest problem they have is what? Sin. And sin does what? separates us from God. That's our biggest problem. God has life. Without God, there's no life. 
And sin separates us from him. And so they need to see that Jesus is talking a really big picture here, really big. And they are stuck down here on, wow, we're going to be treasurer of the biggest bank in the world. You know, and, and we're going to get rid of those nasty Romans who keep doing bad things to us. Okay, God might do that, but he might wait till the end. We don't know how there's always been a Roman Empire. By the way, what happened to every empire? They don't. They're not with us anymore. What happens to every empire in the future? Same thing. It's better to be devoted to the kingdom and let God take care of the empire. You know, we have responsibilities as Christians in our society, but God's going to have to take care of those big problems like that. We do whatever we can to promote the good news about Jesus and peace through him, okay? But we need to, to deal with the big problem. And that's what he's trying to get across to his disciples here. They need to know until the cross, they will not understand the prophecies of Isaiah. They will not understand why he has to do what he does. And so they've got a challenge ahead of them. They're rebuking uh, Jesus, and he says, get behind me, because they are tempting him. He's getting closer to the time when he faces the devil himself. He's never not had fellowship with God, never. He's had fellowship from eternity. And there will come a time when he had to be separated from God because he carried sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 7, God cannot fellowship sin. Jesus had to, to deal with that. We can't even imagine because we are so experienced with sin. But Peter was tempting him with the possibility of giving up. He would have had a group of followers. You remember in John, after he had performed signs, Remember what they wanted to do? Was it John chapter four? Yeah, they wanted to take him by force and make him king. There were people there who wanted him to be king, but for all the wrong reasons. He came to rescue them from their sin. So we begin to see here that Jesus started by asking questions because they are going to have those questions and they don't have the answers yet but there are mighty and powerful answers available, some of which are available in the scripture, which they hadn't understood because their mind's going over here and the scripture is saying, hey, come this way, come this way. And their mind's over here. Sometimes we need to ask ourselves when we're looking at the word of God, am I going the direction God wants? We had an interesting teacher when I was in school preaching. He said, one year, Go through your Bible and mark all the places that are really significant to you. And they said, the next year, go through and read the passages you didn't mark. He said, because you may not know where God wants your mind to go. That's why we read the whole thing every year. It reminds us, oh, whoa. Then we get to all those lists of people and we're going, whoa, somebody remembers that, I am sure. <laughs> I say their name because there are people to be honored. But I don't always get the whole thing, especially when, you know, it's like, we've got two Bobs in here. Well, they got three or four Jeroboams, three or four of these, and it's hard for us to keep it in, in order and in uh, our mind. But the point is, these people are honored and God's word needs to be uh, read and accepted. So in the passage here that, that Jesus has rebuked them, they are not understanding that God takes suffering and transforms it into glory. What they're looking for is the opposite, the world's way of taking life without suffering and expecting some glory of our own. Peter, essentially in that one conversation, went from a rock to a what? Remember Peter means rock? He got that name from Jesus. He, he, he went from a rock to a what? But you might put in there parallel, he became a stumbling block. 
He went from a, a rock to a stumbling block. But what do we know about Peter after the resurrection? Yes, he came back to the rock and he became a rock. He, he endured great persecution and, and uh, suffering for, for his teaching and preaching. So the disciples apparently might have thought that their work with Jesus would be something else than what they thought. If Jesus is the big giver of good things and the big power of smacking down all the enemies in the world, what do you think is going to be your job as a disciple, as one of the 12? What's your job going to be? Ooh, we know what we usually want. Jesus told them, don't be ordering yourself after the world's priorities. You know, it's like, we're up at the top, all 12 of us, we're up at the top, everybody else is down here. Jesus said, nope, it's the other way around. You're down here, and you're serving up. So they might have had the wrong idea about what their work with Jesus was going to be. So you know what he's going to teach them in the next section? What does it mean to be a disciple? They need to understand that. If you don't understand the Messiah, you will not understand what it means to be a disciple. So he's getting it down to the foundation. He's just scraping it off and said, we need to build now. Time is a, a, of an essence. You need to understand who you are as disciples. They need to understand that because they're going to tell other people. You know, someone has been telling this for 2,000 years. And we still know what Jesus said is a disciple because of that. That's the way he intended it to work. We receive it. We also teach it and pass it on. They can't pass on what they don't what? They, they don't know. And even if they have the words, they have to understand it. That's the same with us. It, we, it's not just enough that we repeat the words. We need to understand what the whole thing means. And so we're going to end here. And in the next section, Lord willing, uh, Mark chapter uh, 8, verse 34, we'll see what Jesus is going to teach them about who they are in view of who he is and how their mission as disciples is based on who he is. So if you'll join me, let's uh, say a closing prayer. Father, we do praise you for the love that is ours through your Son. Father, we know that uh, no one loves us in a holy and perfect way like you do. We have no one who cares for us, even in our sin, um, the way you do. And for this, Father, we are thankful. We pray for wisdom that we persevere in difficult times in your word. And Father, that we not give in to the temptations and the whisperings of Satan, but Father, that we come back and stay true. Father, we're so grateful that your son has shown us in his life with the 12 how much he cares and how much he's willing to reteach them and reteach them and reteach them. For we know, Father, uh, sometimes we are so involved in, in the events of our life that we forget what really is important. Thank you for your kindness towards us even today. We pray, Father, you'll be with Chris and the doctors working with him that um, he can have a successful surgery. We pray that you'll continue to be uh, with Tommy and uh, Pamela and the family down there and that you will help him to have a, a good recovery as he uh, heals his injured knee. We pray you'll be with Jean and, and Carolyn uh, and Caitlin and help them to enjoy their time and to return to us safely. Father, thank you for each one here tonight. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.